Hey folks, uh, this is the first of our two asynchronous day lectures. And I want to remind you that by 5 p.m. today, if you're in fact watching this on Wednesday, you can certainly watch it beforehand as I'm going to post it earlier. You've got your third thesis boot camp question. To what extent was the purchase of the Louisiana Territory from France by the United States aligned with Jeffersonian philosophy? Now, you're going to, of course, need one operational definition. That's why I have the little asterisk. So it's important to consider, you know, who did Jefferson represent? What economic and political policies and perspectives did he favor? So what is Jeffersonian philosophy? And we really need to think back to what we know of Jefferson, either from the Declaration of Independence or certainly sort of his role as one of the two Democratic Republican godfathers along with Madison during the 1790s. So we got to take that all into account. You can certainly take into account information that you know from the Debashian if it is relevant. You're going to need one concession with an illustrative example, two main argument subclaims, each with an illustrative example. Remember, as I discussed with illustrative examples, you're basically making a claim that is more general and then backing it up with as exemplified by or as illustrated by. And we always want to keep in mind that those illustrative examples are oftentimes going to be very specific. They're often going to be proper nouns. They're sort of showing us this is an example of which the general subclaim that I've brought up can be seen. OK, so again, the claim should not be the proper noun. The illustrative example should be. So we're going to focus on the Louisiana Purchase uh, in this particular lecture. I'm going to focus on others as well, other material as well, but certainly the question you're going to be writing on is Louisiana Purchase. Now, I mentioned real quickly at the end of the lecture on Friday that 1803 is an absolutely crucial turning point in the American historical narrative for two reasons. One, because of really the first Supreme Court case that we have to know, and there are going to be many, many, many after it, but they're all billed on Marbury versus Madison. Now, as we recall, in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, Jefferson writing for Kentucky and Madison writing for Virginia said, the Alien and Sedition Acts are unconstitutional. And we, as states, under compact theory, have the right to nullify them. We, in fact, as states, came together to create the Constitution and therefore, if we don't like something, we can, in fact, say no to it. Now, again, that didn't take off. No other state sort of adopted that line of thinking. And the idea sort of went away, but it was left undecided. Like, who has the ultimate call on deciding the constitutionality of laws passed by the federal Congress? We're going to see that in Marbury versus Madison, that sort of ultimately get decided. Sort of. We, we think it is, but doesn't necessarily totally get traction. Now, and then where we're going to see this again in the future, literally every single time that the Supreme Court invalidates or uses just judicial review to basically say no to a law passed by Congress, that comes from Marbury versus Madison. Now, it's not going to be another 54 years after 1803 till Supreme Court does it again, but it certainly holds a big new power as a result. The Louisiana Purchase uh, is a huge increase in the amount of land that for the United States. Uh, certainly, we saw in the Treaty of Paris 1783 a significant increase. The Louisiana Purchase is going to be even bigger than that. Where do we see this before? Well, we actually saw an issue around the Mississippi and New Orleans being a place where farmers could send their goods when we were discussing Pickney's Treaty. I'll talk much more about that in case you don't remember Pickney's Treaty. And then where will we see this again in the future? Really, when we're focusing on the Louisiana Purchase, we have to focus on all of the land that is gained, particularly questions of slavery and the expansion of slavery um, as it emerges from this giant new swath of land. So really crucial turning points in terms of the narrative focusing um, much more on the Supreme Court, and we hadn't really talked about them before, and really sort of the reinvigoration of slavery. So here we go, okay? Now, this slide is not in your notes, and this is not a primary source by any means. So it's just something I found when I was Googling um, midnight judges uh, on the internet. It's the best I could find. So let's give some context. So the election of 1800 was the vice president running against the president. So vice president was Thomas Jefferson, a Democratic Republican, also known as a Republican, also known as a Jeffersonian Republican, running against John Adams, a Federalist, only a Federalist. Now, we know that the Democratic Republicans win. So John Adams is a one-term president, just as his son will be. 
And so the DRs win the executive, the presidency, and the legislative branch. So they have both the House and the Senate. So that's two of the three branches. The judicial branch, remember, the president makes decisions on who gets nominated for federal and Supreme Court positions, and then the Senate has to ratify that or confirm it. We, we know that. That's going on right now with Amy Coney Barrett uh, and the U.S. Senate. But... Adams looks at this and goes, wait, 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 our Federalists just got voted out of office. Like, what do we do? How do we keep the Federalism alive? Well, he's like, well, I'll just fill up the judicial branch. One branch will, will be Federalist. And remember, when you put a judge on the federal bench, as we call it, or the Supreme Court, they're there for life. So it's an ingenious call. So right at the last second, we say, you know, the 11th hour, or maybe in this case, the 11th hour and the 59th minute, John Adams creates a whole bunch of sort of judicial positions and basically is like, I'm going to keep federalism alive forever. Now, that's that. There are some complications that we're going to have to get to. And the complications involve a man named William Marbury, who was not a Supreme Court justice. He actually was a justice of the peace, which is a rather low down position for Washington, D.C. Now, what's important to realize here is that William Marbury sort of never got the official paperwork going through to get his job, okay? Just don't go into all the details, but it's crucial to know that, okay? So William Marbury doesn't have the job that he was, quote unquote, promised as a result of this sort of midnight judge's power play by Adams. So Jefferson comes into office. James Madison is his secretary of state. OK, it's going to be important. Secretary of State usually deals with foreign affairs. But in this case, we're going to see some domestic affairs. So William Marbury says, dear Supreme Court. OK, so he actually addresses the Supreme Court. and He says, I want my job. Tell Madison to give it up already. And you're like, well, why does Madison have that job? Well, there was actually a law that said um, that. Let me take that. Let me take that back. It's a little it's, it's confusing. Um, ultimately, um, Madison was the one who was supposed to deliver this sort of paperwork to Marbury. And there was a law that basically said that the Supreme Court could make that happen. They could enforce it. So instead of going to Madison and saying, hey, Madison, give it to me, knowing that Madison was a Democratic Republican, it would never help out this Federalist Marbury. Marbury does an end around and he goes to John Marshall, who's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He has just become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court as a result of something that Adams did in the Midnight Judges. So he's like, hey, I want my job. Marshall, tell Madison to give Marbury the job. It's M to M to M, okay? Now, Madison goes like, well, why would I ever give you the job like, this is a new administration. I'm a Democratic Republican. Of course, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Marbury's like, I want my job. I was promised my job. Madison's like, yeah, you can ask for it, but you're not going to get it because, again, we're from different parties and I have no motivation to help you out. Now, Marshall goes, oh, gosh. Now, the confusing thing about John Marshall is before John Marshall was down here in the right hand corner as the Chief Justice, he was actually the Secretary of State under John Adams, making it way more confusing. He's also a cousin of Thomas Jefferson, even more confusing. So let me get back to this story. Marshall was supposed to be the guy to deliver the paperwork to Marbury back when he was Secretary of State, but he failed. So that's how Marbury finds himself in this predicament. But Marshall says, oh, this is so annoying because if I tell Madison that he has to give the job to Marbury, Madison's gonna refuse. And then the Supreme Court is going to look really weak. Like my branch is going to look really weak because I can't make someone in the executive branch give Marbury his job. So he's like, well, that's not going to work. Okay. So he goes, how can I sort of save face? How can I make this work? He goes, aha, I've got it. You know that law that says that I can tell Madison to give Marbury his job? You know that law? I think that law is unconstitutional. And you're like, what? Huh? Like, wh wh how does that work? What he's effectively saying here is that law, what's called the Judiciary Act of 1789, gave too much power um, away. It, it, it doesn't actually, it breaks sort of this checks and balances. So 
at the end, I'm going to invalidate the law that created this problem in the first place. And so what Marshall does is Marshall basically says the law that gave me the power to tell Madison to give Marbury his job, that's unconstitutional. And in the end, what John Marshall did was he made total lemons out of lemonade, or how did I say that? He made total lemonade out of lemons. The lemons he had were that if he actually did what the law said, he would look really bad. But instead, he looks really good because he now seizes this power to say, I get the power as part of the Supreme Court to determine that a law is unconstitutional. So after all of this confusing situation about Marbury wanting a job and Madison supposed to be giving it to him but not wanting to, and Marshall not wanting to tell Madison to give Marbury his job because he wouldn't have done it, and then Marshall would have looked bad, Marshall turns around and basically says, you know what, once and for all, the Supreme Court has the power to determine if a law is unconstitutional or not. Now, I recognize that that's super confusing because you've got M, M, and M, Marbury, Madison, Marshall. Their names all start with M, A. Two of them start with M, A, R. But what you really need to know after that four-minute ex explanation was that before Marshall, this is the way that the branches looked, okay? The presidency and Congress, they had pretty significant powers. Supreme Court, not really, okay? But what Marshall does is that Marshall basically puts them all on level playing field because in the end, Congress can make a law, the president can sign it, but the Supreme Court ultimately can say yay or nay, which we, what we call judicial review, thereby sort of slapping down that whole compact theory argument saying, no, 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 it's not states who can nullify, it's actually the federal government. Now, we think of John Marshall because of Marbury versus Madison, which his name is not even in it. It's Marbury, the guy who wanted the job, and Madison, the guy who he was suing, Secretary of State. But Marshall's going to have a legacy that goes way beyond Marbury and even way beyond Madison. Because if you look how long he is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Federalists are totally dead, okay? In fact, the Whigs who come after the Federalists will just be born in the early 1830s. It's John Marshall is the last great Federalist. Now, if we, oh, wow, look at this amazing animation I just did. Here we have sort of Alexander Hamilton's ghost sort of speaking into Marshall's ears all the time. And you're going to see Marshall make decision after decision after decision that totally embody all that Hamilton was about. Namely, an emphasis on a, you know, a big national government with a strong economic system and really sort of reducing states' rights. So when we think of what Hamilton was all about, that's what Marshall is going to be all about. And Marshall is going to do his darndest to keep that all alive. So there was a ton there. What we really need to know is Marbury versus Madison, judicial review. John Marshall takes power for the Supreme Court and that Marshall is going to be this great Federalist well after Hamilton and the Federalists themselves are all dead. OK. And in the process, really sort of being a thorn in the Democratic Republican side for one going against his cousin, Thomas Jefferson, and then going against Madison and going against Monroe and then ultimately going all the way against Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. Now. If we look at this map of the United States, it's important to realize that up until 1803, the territory only, territory only went from the Atlantic over to the Mississippi. We know that. Again, that's all part of the Treaty of Paris, 1783. The rest of the land had belonged to Spain, um, and it's going to be a little confusing what's about to happen. So... Even though the land had belonged to Spain, and that's where we get Pickney's Treaty from way back, you know, uh, Charles Pickney uh, got sort of a sweet deal from Spain after it appeared that when John Jay had gone to England and gotten Jay's treaty signed, that we were back in bed with the British and the Spanish were like, oh my gosh, they're back in bed with the British. What does that mean for all of our land in North America? Let's try to get on their good side. Let's give them a little bit of land um, from our Spanish Florida. Let's make sure that Native Americans don't go into Georgia. And perhaps most importantly, let's give them what's known as the right of deposit in New Orleans. So that's, that's really important because if you were to look, 
and C, you know, up in what we would call the old Northwest Territory, I like to call it the North Mideast, all of that, you know, farm, those farm products would go down the Mississippi and they would have to go on ships in New Orleans and they'd have to go out the Gulf of Mexico all the way around the Atlantic up to the Northeast. That was the, believe it or not, the fastest and most efficient way to go. But it wasn't always that there were boats just waiting there in New Orleans. You'd actually have to put them in warehouses. And believe it or not, this right of deposit from Spain to America in Pickney's Treaty allowed for that to sort of sit there in New Orleans until ships came to pick it up. Now, something weird happens. France actually gets New Orleans. And you don't need to know all the diplomatic maneuvers that make it happen. But now, instead of having Spain, who was not really a big threat, France has New Orleans. And Jefferson is worried because even though he'd had this, you know, relationship with France going back to where he'd actually lived in France, been an ambassador to France, and he was a Francophile, he didn't like France being so close, certainly because we know that France always had sort of wanted to get back in to you know, the United States. Remember, you know, the whole we're going to help you out in the American Revolution. Just they always sort of seem to have their eye on the United States after being sort of booted out of there in the Treaty of Paris in 1763 at the end of the French and Indian War. So now that France has New Orleans, Jefferson's concerned. Like, what happens? Will we still have the right of deposit? Will my farmers, my people still be able to send their goods down the Mississippi? So here's what's happening. Okay. So, okay. Napoleon is looking at the North American land that he has, and he had actually wanted to have this Louisiana territory, which he'd recently acquired from Spain, to basically be food growing area that he could then use to basically feed the people that were working in his sugar empire in Santo Domingo or Haiti. Okay, so he's going to have the food from America going down to help you know, feed the people who are making him a ton of money with sugar in Santo Domingo, aka Haiti. But there's a huge slave rebellion led by Toussaint La Overture. Toussaint La Overture. I don't know how to do my French. Um, and he he looks around. And he goes, I don't I don't need this land anymore. Like I don't have Haiti anymore. It's not going to work out. I don't need this land. And on top of it, I'm fighting against Britain again, and so I need money. So I just need to unload this. So Jefferson trying to get New Orleans because he's really concerned about his people being able to send their goods down the Mississippi and he doesn't you know, want the French to interfere with that. He looks at this and he says, okay, 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 okay. France is there. Um, if, I, if I try to fight France, I got a problem. I don't want to fight France. Uh, I'm, you know, I reduced the size of the military. Uh, Army and Navy are much smaller. I'm generally a pacifist. I don't want to fight. But if I do nothing, then my farmers will probably be pissed off. So let's do the easiest thing. Let's offer to buy it, okay? So doesn't really you know, want to fight France, but he knows he needs to do something relative to France. Napoleon may not need you know, New Orleans anymore, may not even need the whole territory anymore. So here's what happens. A deal is made for $15 million, not just for New Orleans, but for all of this land. It boggles the mind to think that almost, you know, a million square miles of land goes for $15 million back then, which I believe is something like $250 million today, which again is, is such a paltry, paltry sum. One of the greatest deals ever. Okay. Now, let me just see real fast. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So I need to go back. I apologize. Okay. So the crucial part that we have to remember here is that Thomas Jefferson found himself in quite a pickle because here he was, he was a strict constructionist. We know that. We know that going back to the Bank of the United States. He said to Hamilton, find it in the Constitution. It's not there. So therefore, the federal government can't do it. So as a strict constructionist, he looks around, he goes, hey, guys, um, presidential advisors, am I allowed to, to buy this land? Because I don't see it anywhere in the Constitution. Remember, I'm a strict constructionist. And they're like, TJ, 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 like, dude, you can't get hung up on this strict construction, man, because we're about to get the most amazing deal ever. Not only are we not going to have to fight France over it, 
but this is going to help out your supporters and look at what it's going to do for the agricultural element in the United States. We are buying so much more land. Any concern you had about Democratic Republicans surviving? <laughs> that's that's ridiculous. Of course we're going to survive because we just got all this farmland. So America is going to be agricultural forever. But TJ is like, but it's not in the Constitution. What do I do? And they're like, dude, just find something. So in the end, uh, he's like, oh, I think I found it. Some like treaty making power. So yes, you know, Congress has treaty making power. And again, you know, I have to sign off on that. So, you know, at the end of the day, us buying all this land can go under our treaty making power. You know, it's it's definitely a loose way of, of, of looking at it. Um, but Jefferson switched. We know that. He switched from much more of a strict to a loose interpretation. And you may say, what a hypocrite, what a hypocrite. But if you think about it, the party in power is always going to try to find ways to, you know, get power for itself. So it may not be that he was a hypocrite so much. It may be the reality that whoever's in power wants a loose interpretation. Whoever's out of power wants a strict interpretation because they want to limit the party in power. So whether it's the Federalists in the 1790s or the Democratic Republicans in the 1800s, maybe it's not that either one you know, became a hypocrite so much as just if you're in power, you want a loose interpretation. Now, speaking of being pissed off and wanting to throw someone, you know, a pity party, here you have Alexander Hamilton, who, who's going to die soon. I, I don't want to spoil things, but he's going to die soon in our narrative. And what you have is him basically writing a, a, a pity party invitation, like come hang out with me at my pity party. This is called The Purchase of Louisiana in a New York paper, and it's also known as the Sour Grapes Argument. And I'm just going to break it down because I think in many ways, it just goes to show you sort of where Hamilton is in this you know, new Jeffersonian world. So Hamilton basically makes a point that, yeah, you know what? At the end of the day, Jefferson's going to get a bunch of credit for this huge purchase. And anybody with a brain will realize that, you know what, it wasn't him. So the implied shade that Hamilton's throwing is like, TJ's going to get all the credit, but come on, it's all luck. And there's nothing wise or shrewd on his part. So don't celebrate TJ for this purchase. Like any idiot could have done this. Okay. Now this whole piece basically explains Napoleon's diplomatic conundrum relative to Haiti and why he needed to unload this. So the implied shade that's being thrown is France wanted a sugar empire in Santo Domingo, but, and that's why Louisiana territory was so crucial, but that failed. So the climate, I wrote weather, but it's really the climate. Okay. And Toussaint Overture, you know, quote, the slave who freed Haiti made, you know, the reality that Santo Domingo wasn't going to work because the sugar empire wasn't going to work. Ergo, you don't need the Louisiana territory. And now France needs money to fight with England. So, of course, they're going to unload it. Again, Jefferson, right place, right time, not a genius. Okay. So then he goes on to say, like, well, if France had held on to New Orleans, everybody knows that England would have just come right in and taken it. And, you know, we wouldn't have wanted that, would we? And Napoleon wouldn't have wanted that, would we? So he gave it to us, basically, for chump change. Again, Jefferson, right place, right time, not a genius. Don't give him credit. If anything, this is all Napoleon doing it, not, in fact, Jefferson, okay? Now, <laughs> he goes further, and he's like, it's all Napoleon's desperation, like, as the words say, Bonaparte found himself absolutely compelled by a situation to relinquish his darling plan. So Napoleon had a plan, didn't work out. Jefferson, right place, right time. I'm pissed. Don't give Jefferson credit. Jefferson couldn't have screwed this up if he tried. <laughs> then he goes, all right. So everyone's saying that there's all this land that we acquired. Why is everyone so excited about the land? It's just New Orleans. New Orleans is the big deal. The land is not the big deal. So in the end, Hamilton just wants to make sure that no one gives Jefferson all of this credit because if Jefferson gets the credit, it just helps, it helps out the Democratic Republicans. And the Federalists are truly a dying party at this time because, yes, they only had one official presidency, Adams, but they really sort of ran the country under Washington and Adams. And now it looks like all of the power has shifted 
to the dirty, dusty farmer. Jefferson is in power. They've acquired all of this land in the Southwest um, that can be used for cotton growing. The writing is on the wall. The Federalist Party is is really fast going to be something that is part of you know the dustbin of history. So Hamilton's doing everything he can, scrambling to throw this you know pity party to make people understand you know again don't you know don't pile on the Federalists and say the Democratic Republicans are great. No, no, no. Anybody could have done this. Okay, so the paranoid Federalists are like we don't think we're going to survive, to be honest. Like, if we're ever going to be a a viable party, we need to do something. So if you take Canada, believe it or not, plus New England, plus New Jersey, plus New York, this is something known as the proposed Northern Confederacy. Now, your book doesn't even write about this. Most textbooks don't, but it's pretty important, okay? Okay. And it was an extreme group of Federalists who called themselves the Essex Junto. And what they proposed literally was, we're going to secede from the United States. We think that the writing is on the wall so much that the Federalists you know, don't have a chance and it's all Democratic Republicans. So let's just take the northern part that you know, obviously is not the dirty, dusty farmer part and let's form our own country. And the first person they came to was Alexander Hamilton. They're like, come on, Hamilton, you're the Federalist godfather. We want you to be our guy to lead this. And Hamilton's like, listen, I may be a Federalist and I may be upset about all this, but I'm not a traitor. Like, I'm not going to betray my country and go with your like secession plan. So he says no. But Aaron Burr, he says yes. So Aaron Burr's like, yeah, 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 I'm down with this which is fascinating because Aaron Burr at the time is actually the vice president of the United States. So here you have the vice president of the United States colluding to be part of this crazy secession plot. And ultimately that, that is going to be what comes between Hamilton and Burr that ultimately leads to Burr killing Hamilton in a duel. Sorry, spoiler alert. And the play doesn't really get into this at all. But I do want you to know that when we talk about sort of, you know, secession, it's not just the South seceding with, you know, South Carolina going in 1860 and the rest of the Confederacy going in 1861. There was ultimately a plan early on for the northern states to also take Canada with them and to secede. Okay, I'm actually going to stop right here.